Hello, this is our talk, Code, Docs, and Tests, What's in the General Registry? And I'm Eric Henson. And I am Jose Giordano. So some months ago, uh, my colleague Jamie Quinn analyzed the, all the papers that, are, uh, that have been published in the journal uh, Open Source Software. So he found that uh, out of all the packages that are in this journal, only 20% uh, use uh, continuous integration, like uh, GitHub Actions or Travis. We like to think that Julia is a very uh, easy to use language. And so we wondered, is it true that our packages in the um, Julia ecosystem do actually follow best practices like uh, using documentation, testing, and continuous integration? And so to answer this question, Eric and I developed a package called uh, Package Analyzer, which um, enabled us to look into many, also many other statistics about the Julia ecosystem. So the general registry is um, a collection of packages that you can uh, easily install in uh, your Julia REPL. So for example, when you type add the name of the package in uh, the Julia REPL in the package mode, the package manager will, will look it up the name of the package in this uh, registry. In general, it's the default uh, registry and one with uh, most uh, packages in the Julia ecosystem. So as of uh, uh, June 2021, the general registry collects over more than 5,000 packages for a total of about uh, uh, 40,000 versions. So general has many packages, as Mose said, and they have a lot of code. So we counted there's over 8,000, 8 million lines of Julia code in the source directory of the various packages. And almost 12 million lines of code if you look in the entire directory, not just SRC. This does include doc strings, unfortunately due to a bug in Toke, which we're using to count the lines of code. So these numbers include doc strings from here on out. And we can see this plot histogram of how big are these packages. So the median is 508 lines of code, and you can see most packages fall in this first bin of under 1,000. But actually the distribution becomes more clear if we look at a log scale on the x-axis. So here we can see that the lines of Julia source code um, look very much like a log normal distribution centered around 508 lines of code. And you can see there's some, a few very big packages, a few very small packages, and then most packages fall in the middle here. And we can see that th one of the biggest packages is wordcloud.jl, which is a nice package to uh, make this cool word cloud. And you can see AWS SDK is by far the largest. And that uses generated code automatically generated Julia code, as does aws.jl, and I think some of the other big ones. Um, so we can also look at the, this is the top 14 largest packages by lines of Julia code in SRC. And as we saw from the word cloud, these AWS ones are the largest, and but lots of other ones as well. Oops. We can also look at what other languages are there. So people often talk about how you know, most Julia code is written in Julia, and we don't need to wrap other libraries to have high performance code, though sometimes we do wrap other libraries because they're good. If we look at what languages are present anywhere in Julia package directories, we find it, of course, mostly Julia code. And the second most is HTML, which is probably for docs and things like that, along with JSON and XML. And then there's C headers, CSS, JavaScript, and then others actually higher than TOML, which is for project.tomls and manifest.tomls and so forth. You can see the distribution here. We can also look at, if we restrict ourselves to the source directory, then it's by far mostly Julia, followed by JavaScript and JSON and Fortran. We can also look in a log scale if we want, and then the differences don't look so big. But of course, this is over an order of magnitude difference here. It is sometimes a misconception that it is sufficient to publish uh, the source code of your software on the internet to make it open source. But this is not true, because without further specifications, it is assumed that the author of the code retains all the rights uh, to use and distribute this code. Instead, in order to qualify um, a software as open source, you need also to provide a license. The Julia General Registry requires to use a license approved by the Open Source Initiative, also called OSI. But uh, we only started to automatically enforce this zero last March. If you're unsure about uh, what license to use for your package, you can check out the website choosealicense.com or also listen to Eric uh, about what are the most common um, licenses in the Julia ecosystem. Yeah, so most packages in general do have an open source license. That's by far, the, far and away the majority of packages, although they're all supposed to have, have one. So why no license detected could happen is either they don't have a license, which isn't good, or our auto detection failed to identify the license, but they do have a license. And interestingly, there's also a few other licenses we found 
where they don't have an OSI approved license, but they do have some kind of license in the package directory. And we can see in general, most packages have an MIT license. That's by far the most common, followed by a GPL license. And then unfortunately, no license is number three, followed by Apache. And as Mose said, we started enforcing during when you try to register a package, it'll check, can it detect an OSI approved license? And if not, it won't automatically merge the new version of your package or, or new package. And since requiring that, we have seen the fraction of packages using an open source license increase by a percent or two over the past few months, which is encouraging. So if you want uh, your users to be able to actually use your package, it's important to provide documentation. So to tell them how to run the commands, how to use how to use all the functionalities provided by your package. Documentation uh, can sometimes be found in the form of a few paragraphs in the readme, but very often uh, this is also uh, more extensive and hosted on an external website. Uh, it is important to document uh, your package to let the users know how to use it. Documentation can usually be found in the form of a few paragraphs uh, in the readme file, but sometimes uh, it is more extensive and it is uh, hosted on a separate website. You can uh, attach some uh, descriptions to variables and functions in your package in Julia, and these are called the doc, string, uh, doc strings. You can access the doc strings of um, the, these functions and variables by typing uh, the question mark in the Julia REPL uh, so that you enter the help uh, mode in the REPL. And also you can have doc tests that are automatic tests uh, which can be run together with the rest of the tests of, the, of your package to make sure that Doc strings and documentation is up to date. And here you can see an example of a doc string for the mod to pi function. So you can see the syntax of the function, a short description, some notes, and also an example of use. And this example of use is in the form of a doc test. So should the syntax of this function ever change, or also the value of this function ever change, this will be caught by the automated doc test. In order to publish the documentation, there are different tools that uh, Julia developers can use. Uh, for example, documenter, doc strings, extensions.gl or also publish.gl, which is an experimental replacement for uh, documenter. Uh, documentation for most packages lives in the same repository as the package itself, but sometimes it is hosted on a different uh, website, for example, with GitHub or GitHub pages. But uh, for some uh, larger ecosystem of packages, uh, you will find that the documentation of the entire ecosystem lives on a completely different uh, dedicated repository. Yeah, and we can see that 88% of packages in general have at least 20 lines of either readme or documentation in the docs directory or doc directory of the package. We can see if we look at just which packages have at least 20 lines of readme, that goes down to 72%. If we ask for 40 lines of readme, it goes down to 48%. 20 lines of docs is only 37%, 10% of docs. So this means we add up the, the amount of code in the docs directory and in the source directory. And that's our total code. And then we divide the amount of code in the doc directory by that and ask, is that at least 10%? That's 33%. And if we look for 20% docs, 19%. We can look at this data in maybe a little bit more of a detailed way. Oh, we'll get to that. First, we can look at how long our Julia package read means. So you can see in the most case, they're under 20 lines, but the median is actually 37 lines. And some packages have very long read means up to um, 1,284 lines. Yeah, and, and this is going back to the idea of looking at the docs as a percentage of the code base. We can see about 50% of packages have 0% docs. They don't have any docs at all, though they might have doc strings or, or readme as another way to provide documentation. And we can see we've highlighted a few points. So 33% of packages have at least 10% docs, and then 4% of packages have at least 50% docs. So there's no, there's no right ratio that packages should have. We're just exploring what is out there. But the important thing is that users can use, use your package. So. Tests are an important part of the development of packages. So tests are assertions about the result and the behavior of your code. Tests ensure that the package do what they are expected to, to do. And so the, the functions give the right numerical results, also the errors are entered correctly, and so on. Uh, but you can also uh, make sure that uh, once you fix a bug, this is not brought back uh, by accident in the future with uh, new changes. Uh, the most popular testing framework in the Julia ecosystem is the test standard library. And we can see here an example of a simple set of tests. So we can check, for example, the result of some functions or that a specific function returns uh, an error. And then you get, after you run the test set, you get the summary of these tests. You can also very easily run the um, test of your package uh, if this is set up with a 
test the standard library uh, using the Julia package manager just by running a test and then the name of your package. And again, you will see the summary of all the tests that are passing or not in case there are some failures. But the test uh, standard library is not the only testing framework in the Julia ecosystem. There are also some other packages that are listed here that can be used for uh, testing. So we can look again at how many packages in general do have tests. We find that 96% of packages at least have the run tests.jl, which is the entry point for, for testing with the package commands. But if we look at, do they have at least 10 lines of tests in the test directory, that drops to 89%, 20 lines down 84%. And then we can again look at percentages by adding up the amount of code in the test directory in the Julia directory and seeing what percentage of that is the test directory. So if we look for packages with at least 10% tests, it's 76%, and at least 20% tests, it's down to 56%. We can look at how this has changed over time and find that it has not changed very much over time, which kind of makes sense. And we can also look at the amount of tests as a percentage of code base, again, as a sort of reverse cumulative density function, where if we look at what percentage of packages has at least some percentage of tests, 76% of packages, at least 10%, 56 at least 20%, and so on. And there's actually a few percent of packages have a very high percentage of their code base being tests. We can also put back the uh, docs plot that we saw a few slides ago, just overlay it on top of this plot so you can see the differences. And we see that it's uh, much more common to have uh, a higher percentage of your code base being tests than it is docs. But I should explain here, the way we're calculating the percentages for the docs case, it's like docs over docs plus source, and in the test case, it's uh, test over test plus source. So they're not, the percentages could add up to greater than one if you had a small source directory, if that makes sense, hopefully. And we can also look at histogram. So this is the same data before, but instead of a cumulative density function, we're looking at a, a histogram, and we can see the median percentage of code in tests is 23%, but it's, it's fairly flat over here. So there's a lot of different possibilities coming from close to 0% to 30% or so, and then it starts pulling off. Um, and we can also look, is there a correlation between having a high percentage of tests and high percentage of docs? And we can see there really is not. This does not look like a correlated scatter plot at all. But we can see the, the blue line down here corresponds to all the packages which don't have docs at all. But they may still have a very high amount of tests. We can also look at the distribution of lines of code across docs, test, and source. So in here, Every package in general is represented with a column in docs, a column in tests, and a column in source in the same order. So they're ordered by the total code size. And if they don't have any docs, then there's nothing there. So you can see the docs bar plot here is a bit sparser because only 50% of packages have, have docs. And we can see the most dense looking one is, is the source. We can also look at this in the linear scale. So that, that, this was in a log scale. On the linear scale, it's very much dominated by the outlier packages, which have a huge amount of source code or tests. But we can see the total, total amount of source code is higher. It's a little bit easier to see in, in this linear plot than it is on the, on the log scale. Continuous integration refers to various sets of development practices. Here, by continuous integration, we mean the practice of running automated tests for your package whenever um, someone submits the code to uh, a remote repository or opens a pull request to propose new changes for a package. Automated tests can be either run on a virtual machine in the cloud or a dedicated local machine, but it is a, a less common option. But there are many different providers, continuous integration services, and these are, for example, GitHub Actions, uh, Travis CI, AppVayor, GitHub Pipelines, just to mention the most popular. Continuous integration is very useful because most developers work on, on a single platform or maybe a couple, but they may not have easy access to different platforms or they're, maybe they're not familiar with some specificities on different uh, platforms. Uh, and instead, uh, continuous integration services uh, providers lets you run the test on all these different, for example, operating systems or also different architectures. So they can be x86, 64 uh, or also different ARM architectures, 32 or uh, 64 bits or, or even power PC. So this allow you to make sure that the packages work well equally on all the platforms that are tested with the continuous integration services. We can see that 95% of packages have at least some form of CI set up as we measured by the presence of CI scripts in the package directory. And 80% of packages have GitHub Action 42% as Travis, and then 13% at Fire, and then the rest of only one or 2%. We can look at how these CI choices have changed over the past few months where we've collected data. 
And we found that most of the case, most of the providers are pretty flat, except for Travis, which has decreased in popularity over the past few months. And GitHub Actions looks like it's gone up a little bit. The bus factor is a popular uh, concept in uh, the software development. This is defined as how many people working on a project need to be hit by a bus in order to stop its development. Uh, this is not very easy to measure, this factor. But one way is to say that if there is only one person or around one person working on a project, sub part of a project, then there is a high risk that the, if this person disappears for any reasons, the development of that software or the part of the software will be at risk. Instead, if there are many people working or maintaining a software, then there is a, a much less, much smaller risk. A, a way to reduce this risk is to share the development with other people. And this, for example, on GitHub, it can be done by moving uh, the repository where the development happens uh, to an organization so that uh, many people can access it instead of only the main maintainer. And we found that in the Julio ecosystem, around 42% of the packages are part of uh, GitHub organizations. We can also look at how many contributors there are to the Julio ecosystem. And we found that this has gone up over time. So it was in April, it was 4,685. And then today, or last week, I guess, end of, end of June, it was up to 4,931. We can also look at the distribution of how many contributors are there per package. So how many packages have, have how many contributors? So here, contributors were obtained from the GitHub API, so they'd have to I've made a commit with an email that's associated to a GitHub account. So this definitely doesn't capture all of the possible um, contributors, but at least let us make sure there weren't duplicates because GitHub is associating these commits to it to one account. So we found that the median number of contributors measured this way was two with 3,410 packages having less than four. And then it falls off um, pretty quickly, though there's some packages have as many as 171 contributors. This is the same data, but now we've plotted it on the log scale in this reverse CDF form. So you can see again that 57.5% of packages have at least two contributors, 583 packages have at least 10 contributors, and 76 packages have at least 40 contributors. We can also look at the number of commits per package and find the median package has 59 commits, but again, it follows this nice log normal distribution so that x-axis here is on the log scale, and we find a, a normal distribution centered around that, that median. This is a pretty flawed metric because one commit could be very small or very large, but it is still interesting to see the distribution here. And so again, we can look at the number of commits per package as a, as a reverse CDF. So what percentage of packages has at least so many commits? And we find that 4,658 packages have at least 10 commits. So that's almost all of them, 93%, whereas only 35% of packages have at least 100 commits, and 2.4% of packages have at least 1,000 commits. We can also look at the contributor side. So how active are open source contributors? So here we're looking at what percentage of contributors contributed to at least so many packages. So by definition, 100% of the contributors contributed to at least one package, 48% contributed to two, 31% to three, about 10% contributed to at least 10 packages, and half a percent contributed to at least 100 packages. I believe including Mose here. We can also look at how many commits did each person make who has contributed to a, a Julia package. So we're on a, on a log scale on the x-axis here, and we can see the median is about 10 commits, but there's a whole, whole distribution here. We can also look at it on a linear scale, which is maybe more informative here. So yeah, we can see the biggest bin by far is the one, under 100 commits bin with 3,883 contributors. We can also look at this as a CDF. So we can see that, for example, 59.5% of contributors make at least five commits, about 20% of contributors make at least 100 commits, and 51 contributors, or 1%, um, make at least 2,500 commits. And we can see also the Total here is 4,931 people. So close to the same as the number of packages. 
Now that you learned about uh, documentation, testing, and continuous integration, if you wanted to start developing your new Julia package, don't worry because we have some tools that will help you to set up all these things. So the standard library is a simple to create a, a very simple package, but there are also external packages like uh, package templates.jl or package skeleton.jl that provides you some customization about uh, what um, tools you want to, to add to the um, um, package, for example, documentation, testing, or many different um, continuous integration services. So package analyzer.jl is the package Mose and I developed to uh, get the numbers for all these plots that we've been showing you. And you can use it for your own packages too. And it hopefully is pretty easy to use. So you just call using package analyzer after you add it to your environment and you can give it the name of a package in the general registry and it will clone that package and count things like the number of lines of code, check whether or not it has documentation, has tests, has continuous integration, and so forth. There's different ways to use it. So that main entry point is this analyze function, which you can just give it the name of a package. If you'd like more advanced things, you can use this find package function that will locate where the package is in your local registry. And this allows you to do things like pass another registry instead of the general registry if you have a, a custom registry set up. You can also pass a module if you use the package share function available in Julia. So if we already have this package loaded, we can use package share, and then we don't have to clone the package. It'll just use the code that's already downloaded. You can also use a URL. You could pass a URL to analyze if you want to analyze, for example, an unregistered package. You can also use this in combination with another package called packagedeps.jl. In this example, we're going to look at the package data frames and we'll use the package steps function to get all of its dependencies. And then these come as um, name, UUID pairs. So we'll use keys to get just the names. Sorry, it's a dictionary. So we'll use keys to get just the names. Then we'll pass this to our find packages function, which we just showed you above. This can take a list of packages and find all of them in the registry. And then pass that to analyze, which has a threaded method for dealing with lists of packages. You can do it in parallel if you start Julia with multiple threads. And then the output is actually a tables.jl compatible table. So you can pass that to data frames to get a data frame of the results. So here we see the 17 dependencies of data frame, not including standard libraries. And we get a nice table with name, UUID, the repository of the package, the subdirectory, if a package is located in the subdirectory of the GitHub repo, whether or not we we're successful in reaching the package to clone it, and then lots of information about the docs, the tests, different CI providers, whether or not they were found, information about the license. So we get a list of all the license files that we could locate and things like the file name, which licenses were in that license file and so forth. Lots of information about the lines of code, the contributors and, and so forth. For the contributors, you need to give it a GitHub token so that it can authenticate to the GitHub API. So that's why it's empty here is that we haven't set up a GitHub token for this example. So in this talk, uh, we reported uh, what we found in the general registry using the package analyzer.jl package. So we can conclude that most Julia packages do follow good programming, pra uh, good programming practices like documentation, testing, and continuous integration. In particular, we found a very high fraction of packages uh, that use tests and also that have at least 10% of tests, uh, about 76%. We also found that uh, most packages also use continuous integration, or about 95%, while uh, documentation is not as popular, because um, only 49% uh, of packages have the docs, uh, at least in the repository. But this doesn't mean that uh, they are not documented at all, because documentation can be either, for example, in the readme or in a different repository. Sorry. Uh, we also found that uh, most packages have either a readme or a docs. So, uh, for example, 88% of packages have at least 20 lines of uh, one of the two. In March 2021, the General Registry started enforcing the presence of um, an OCI-approved license in order to register new versions and uh, new packages. And we found a, a fraction of packages uh, that have an open source license uh, continuously increases since then. And now we are about at 97%. So we found that enforcing this rule uh, was really effective. The medium package has about 500 lines of code. And we also found that the, the distribution looks uh, look normal. There are almost 5,000 Julia, uh, Julia users who contributed to packages uh, registered on GitHub. And most packages are developed, unfortunately, by a single developer. So this means a very low bus factor.
There are almost 600 packages that have at least uh, 10 contributors, while only 11 packages have more than uh, 100 contributors. 470 users contributed to at least 10 different packages, while 26 people have commits to more than 100 packages. So we wanted to um, thank all of the developers of the packages that we use. We printed our package that status here so you could see the list, but we in particular wanted to thank Algebra of Graphics, DataFrames, Maki, Pluto, and I should add actually WordCloud.jl, which is not in our environment here, but we used to produce the, the WordCloud you saw earlier. So we hope the package ecosystem can continue to grow and continue to follow best practices.